Today, I'm going to talk about a bit of advanced DMing called that I'm going to call jQuay's style design. I'm not the one who came up with this title. Jquay, jQuaying the dungeon is something that Justin Alexander from the Alexandrian, I think, popularized. The, the term jQuay's style design, the, the, the term jQuay's, comes from Janelle jQuay's, a designer of D&D products as far back as the late 70s, who had a very interesting style for building dungeons that offered a lot of things that made players excited to explore them. In his article, which you can find linked in the show notes below, and Justin's article about jQuay's style design, you can see the kinds of specific designs that exist there. And while they're focused primarily around the idea of dungeon design, and we're going to get into the specifics of what those mean, while it focuses on the idea of dungeon design, it also can be used for overland travel as well. This, a lot of the same techniques can be used for overland travel as well. So today we're going to look at what those specific design ideas are and how you can how you can use them in your own, in your own game. My goal for this video is to to share those design principles so that you can use them to find good maps and build your own, particularly for, for both dungeons and for overland travel. If you are designing your own maps, many DMs like to design their own maps. These are some things, this is almost like a checklist of things that you can look through and say, does do I have these things? Or do I have most of these things? Or at least consider these things while you're building your dungeon. But also it helps you look at dungeons that other people are putting out, maps that you might find that you can look at and say, oh yeah, that map hits these ideas. Ideas. It's got these concepts in it. And that way I can kind of grab that map and drop it right in my game and use that. But the other interesting thing is that you can use it for point crawls. You can use it for this idea of traveling in overland as well. And we're going to we're going to talk about that. So I mentioned that Janelle J. Quays was a designer back in the in the late 70s. Janelle J. Quays also did a lot of map design for video games. I believe she did some for Quake and she did some for Counter-Strike and Halo. I think she did it for one of the Halo games as well. So she has done actually design for video game maps as well as everything else. Again, that idea of making maps that are interesting to players, that are fun to explore, big component of her design. There is a link to her biography on Wikipedia down below. And this whole idea, again, comes from articles that Justin Alexander wrote called jQuaying the Dungeon. She has since said, I would prefer you refer to it as jQuaising the Dungeon because her name is Janelle jQuays. And she's like, that S is there for a reason. So I'm calling it jQuays style techniques. But you can find a link to Justin Alexander's articles, fantastic articles down in the show notes below. There's also other videos on YouTube that have talked about this as well. I'm going to link to some of those videos in the, in the description below. So let's talk about the details. What exactly is a jQuay's style dungeon? So a jQuay's style dungeon has a few different characteristics. Justin breaks down a lot of these characteristics, but I'm going to focus on seven pieces. And as a DM, you can kind of look at these pieces and say which ones make sense and which ones don't, and choose the ones that you that you really like. Some of the characteristics of jQuay's style design includes multiple entrances. Are there multiple ways to actually access this dungeon? Can you get in from alternate paths? Are there multiple paths once you're in there? There? Is there not just one sequential path that you're going through from room to room, but is there multiple ways to get through a dungeon? Are there loopbacks? Once you've gotten so far in, can you see other routes that loop back around and reach other places that you're familiar with? That adds this element of discovery, this idea of like, oh, now I know where we are. Now I know where we're in relation because I went this other path, but I can see this other path back. That's a loopback. Elevation changes. These could be either minor elevation changes or major elevation changes. Do you have sections of your dungeon that sit over another side? Are there stairs? Stairwells that lead down? Are there tunnels that go underneath other parts of the tunnels? Elevation changes like that. Are there secret passages and connections? Are there secret ways to get from one place to another? Are there secret rooms? It works best when it's not just a secret room off to its side, but actually a whole other passage that can go around another part so that the characters and the players feel like they're gaming the system. They feel like they've figured out a secret and a secret way to bypass stuff. You want to add things like that. Are there multiple level connections? If you have a multi-layer design, multiple levels, is there like, well, yeah, there's a stairwell that takes you from one to two, but there's also a well that goes all the way from level one to level four or there's this huge crack that cuts across the dungeon that actually connects three levels of the dungeon together if you have multiple level connections that adds a lot of interesting layers to your dungeon and of course you don't have a uniform design that there isn't one sort of sequential design justin refers to this as non-euclidean design this idea that not everything is perfectly symmetrical and works well but it's strange it operates in strange ways the reasons why we want to do this kind of thing is they give players a feeling 
feeling of discovery that while they're exploring a dungeon, they get this feeling that they're starting to crack the design. They're beginning to understand it, but it's complicated enough that they're not going to understand it right away. If you have a sequential dungeon, if you have five rooms connected by four hallways, they're going to understand how that works. There's only one path and they're going to know what it looks like. But if the, if there's these options, oh, which one, which entrance do we want to take? Do we need to go through the front door? Do we want to try to sneak over the wall or are we going to use that old sewer system? That's why I like having multiple entrances is really useful. And we want to offer meaningful choices. Instead of going in a room and there's a hallway to the left and a hallway to the right, why are you going left? One is a natural passageway or one is a sewer that hasn't been touched in a while but could be filled with terrible oozy monsters. But the other way is going to be guarded more carefully. We want to offer those meaningful choices. We want to make sure that the choices that we're offering to players, there's a reason why they would want to pick one over another and that both of them are valid. We don't want to just say like, well, one is clearly the better choice. We want to offer multiple choices where it's clear why you would take one choice over another, but there's good reasons to do one over the other. This kind of design gives players the excitement of discovering secrets. Secret doors, Justin Alexander has another thing where he talks about discovering traps. And he says like, they, you want your players to discover nine out of the 10 traps because discovering a trap is way more fun than stepping in one. You want us to have sometimes where they step in a trap. The same way with our dungeon design, that when the characters get to discover what's going on, when they find these secret passageways, when they find these ways, especially if those ways let them crack the dungeon design, it really feels cool. It gives them that excitement of understanding how the dungeon works. Like, how does this place operate? They're learning it piece by piece. Again, the place is complicated enough that they have to figure it out. There's some level of system mastery required for them to figure it out. But once they figure it out, they go, ah, this is really cool. And it makes the place feel real. If you have a great big dungeon and part of that dungeon was hit by an earthquake and there's a giant crack and the crack actually connects three layers if you just throw a rope over, it makes it feel real. It doesn't feel like you're building a puzzle for the characters or it, it makes it feel like they They've got this place where there's a real reason to go. So what are some examples of Jayquay's style dungeon design? So I'm going to pick the Tomb of the Nine Gods from Tomb of Annihilation, the adventure Tomb of Annihilation. Will Doyle designed this dungeon. Will Doyle has talked about the design of this dungeon. DM David actually did an article that talked about this. I will link to the DM David article in the link below. It's really good. But what you can see just from layer one, just from the first level, because this is a multi-level, I think five or six levels, but we're just going to pick on this first level. And the neat thing about this dungeon is it's got multiple paths. It only has one entrance, one main entrance, so it's violating that one. But we do have like this whole cross-cutting river that cuts through and it can connect to multiple places that's that multiple levels it's got that sort of asymmetric design it's got ways that it cuts through you also have these secret doors that lead to secret areas and that's because this whole dungeon has like a separate set of hallways that the people operating the dungeon work in so when the characters figure out how to crack this part of it they are able to discover things that they, whoever built the dungeon in the first place didn't want you to discover and that is fun so there's a lot of really cool bits here you can see like there's a secret wall on the right hand side leading from this one chamber that goes down to the river so you don't have to go back out the same way you can instead go down to the river so that's one example of a j quay style dungeon you can see it's got secret passages it's got secret connections it's got loopbacks it doesn't have multiple entrances but that's kind of the design of the adventures there's one big door that you that you get through it's got elevation changes it's got lots of different things for a much simpler example we have some of the maps that we used in fantastic layers fantastic layers is a book that i worked on with scott fitzgerald gray and james intercasso and some of the things that i was working Working on with the design is I was keeping these ideas of jQuay style dungeons even for very small layers. So it doesn't need to be nearly as extensive as, as what you saw with the Tomb of the Nine Gods. So this is an example from Caves of the Cockatrice, which is actually a free layer that you can download. Again, links in the show notes below. And you can see it's got multiple entranceways. We have an entrance, we have actually three different ones. There's a passageway from the north from the southeast. There's the most direct passageway and then there's an underground river that you could you could potentially follow. There is a secret entrance right here. If you're going into this main hall, there's a secret entrance to the north that leads you to this big hole and this hole leads down into the river so you could actually follow the river which then can go up a waterfall and lead to the back of the chamber. And then a central main chamber. So we have elevation changes we have secret doors we have loopbacks we have alternate passageways but it's really like a three room dungeon you have this main entrance here you have this little side secret entrance here and then you have this main hall and then like a small small passage so this is a very small dungeon four or five rooms and some of them are very small but we included all of the loopbacks the secret paths all of the stuff that you can see in a jquay style design i tried to pack into some of these small maps this is the map for the lair called ithric's black bile where you fight a black dragon in the same way there's only one entrance but we have one entryway 
way in. There is a sewer that's in sort of a fetid pool over here on the right that leads to this whole secret passage. There's a really nasty undead white down here. And that sewage passage, you can sort of get elevation change, right? We went from this one level. We go one level down. You follow this hallway. It skips out this whole other area. And you come out this sewer in the rear part of the lair. And then we also have the main area that you can go to. We have elevation changes. We have loopbacks. We have secret passages. You can see a lot of the designs that we have in, again, very simple map. It's really one big room, but it's got a couple of like entry halls in it. Choices. Characters can make choices about where they go. One thing I've learned, if you offer a main path and a secret path, players are almost always going to pick the secret path because it's cool and that's fine. It, you, you still want to make sure the main path is a viable way to go. You don't want to assume they're only ever going to take the secret path but you can probably guess that they're likely to take the secret path. So if you offer a secret path, expect that they're going to go down that way. One of the other things we did with the design of this adventure is the number of encounters that you go through is the same in whatever path you take. That way you can fit it into your, into your adventure. So if you're offering multiple paths and loopbacks and everything, you want to kind of think about, well, how many encounters are the characters going to run into? And does that fit the number of encounters I'm expecting for the time that I have or the pacing that I want for the game? So that's something to consider when you're, when you're looking at this. One more example from Fantastic Layers on what a, J. Quay's style design looks like in a very small package. This is from the Centipede Cult Adventure. It's a first level adventure part of the layers. And again, very straightforward. Main entry hall, little side hall. You can go right through the main door and deal with the evil cultists that are going on here. Or you can find this little secret path. This is very simple and straightforward. This is about as simple as you can get. Doesn't really have elevation changes, although it's got a big hole. Maybe you have a whole dungeon level below that hole. Right in the, in the book, it's just filled with a giant centipede. But you've got multiple paths. You've got loop backs. You've got secret Secrets, you've got all that kind of thing. This is about as simple as you can make a Jayquay's style design and still have it offer some fun, some fun alternatives. For another example of a Jayquay style dungeon, I picked one from Dyson Logos. One thing that when I when I mentioned before that this gives you the opportunity to go look at other people's maps and decide does it have these elements in it? And not it's not to say like one map is good and one map is bad if it doesn't, but you can definitely tell linear based dungeons versus more of a Jayquay's open style dungeon. Dyson from DysonLogos.com definitely understands how Jayquay's style maps work. So this map from Dyson Logos definitely is way bigger than the ones we did for Fantastic Layers. But again, you can see all of these ideas in here. It's got elevation changes. You have this whole waterway in the back. You've got multiple entrances. There's a secret entrance over here on the right, upper right. There is a, on the lower side, there is a whole river that flows through. There's main chambers and it looks almost symmetric, except not quite. There's different, different layers that go in. You have secret passageways. You have loopbacks. You have all of the different things. Again, really big dungeon, lots of different ways to explore. And you could you could just grab this and fill it out with your own ideas. You can see the secret passages in the upper right. So definitely grabs onto those, those, those ideas of loopbacks, elevation changes, multiple entrances, multiple paths, secret discoveries, all, the, all those kinds of things. The last dungeon I will look at is one from the adventure Vault of the Dracolich. This is actually a dungeon that I designed with Teo Sabadilla and Scott Fitzgerald Gray for a project that we did for Wizards of the Coast about 10 years ago. And my, my little claim to fame is this is in the Dungeon Master's Guide. If you go in the back of the Dungeon Master's Guide, you can find this map. What I find interesting about this one is this is the one where I started to learn about these ideas. Because when I first designed the map, I sent it into Wizards of the Coast. Greg Bilsland was working there. And Greg Bilsland said, yeah, that's not the kind of map design we're using for D&D Next. Those sort of linear, sequential, one room after another, that's not how it goes. We need more interconnections. We need more loops. We need these stuff. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I had to learn this idea while we were designing this map. But I think it came out really well. Again, this is actually used for a multi-table event. So not only does it have multiple entrances, it has enough entrances that like six different groups could come in from different sides. So we have one, two, three at the top, four, five, six seven different entrances all kinds of loopbacks, all kinds of secrets. Like down here in the jail cell area, you can pull these up and you can go down to the river area. Elevation changes, secret entrances, multiple paths, multiple ways to go through. There is a whole lot of different ways to interact with this. This is another example that kind of encapsulates these principles for what a Jayquay's style dungeon has. Looking back at those characteristics, what are they? multiple entrances, multiple paths, loopbacks, elevation changes, secret passages, multiple level connections if you have a multi-level dungeon and a non-uniform design. All the maps that I showed kind of have those ideas. Not all of them have all of them. For example, elevation changes, sometimes they don't have them. Multiple entrances, sometimes you don't want it. So don't hang on too hard to all of these. But these are a lot of really good principles that I think we can apply. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. We cannot only use these for dungeons. We can use these for overland travel as well. 
if you think about overland travel, there is a concept in overland travel. Again, Justin Alexander is the one who got this term to me. It actually came from the Hills Canton blog. Again, I will link to all of the sources for this, which is this idea of a point crawl. I've talked about point crawls too before. So there's a link to my video about point crawls. There's a link to my article about point crawls. You can find all that in the show notes below. The idea of a point crawl is essentially you're building overland travel like you're building a dungeon. Instead of rooms and passages, you have locations and paths. You have, and, and a location may be small. It could be like a single monument in the woods, a weird statue that's kind of half buried in the woods, or it could be a whole city. And the pathway could be anything. It could be a dry riverbed. It could be a game path. It could be a weird, unnatural path where butterflies always seem to be flowing. It could be a ley line you see in the sky that happens to be pulling a certain way. So the paths can be anything, but they should be something that you can see in, in, in the world. And when you're designing a point crawl, you can keep a lot of the same principles in mind that you're doing for a jQuery style dungeon. Does it have loopbacks? Does it have secret paths? Does it have ways that you can kind of come into it? Does it have multiple ways that you can get out? Do you Are they offering mean, meaningful decisions? Some of the stuff like elevation changes, you could certainly have that. Do you want to go through the mountain pass versus going down the riverbed? So you have sort of a Z axis approach to it. A lot of the same principles apply. And we're going to take a look at just a couple of point crawls that do this. So here's an example point crawl that I use for an Eberron game. This one's a little bit symmetrical. It was some of my earliest work designing a point crawl. You have locations and you have pathways. I didn't identify the pathways themselves, but you could definitely identify like, what is this path? What does it have here? But the idea is, you know, if they start at Karshak Station, which path do they want to take? And do, can they find secret paths that lead elsewhere? This is actually in the very next session. This is about going through a town. And the idea is that you can start at like the Impaled, this one section, and you have these different paths that you can take. There are, the, da the dashed lines are secrets. So like the the old tunnel and the the teleporter. You have the like the road of triumph, the cracked road, the twisted black thread. These are all different ways that the players can navigate this city that they're traveling through. This is kind of a fancy way to do it. You can really just take a piece of paper and draw it. But again, what do you see? Asymmetric design, secret paths, loopbacks, all the same kind of stuff. Multiple entrance ways. In this case, they could go in through the front gate or they could actually go through from the back. The same kind of principles that apply for dungeon design can apply to overland travel as well. When you're sitting down thinking about how people are going to travel in the overland, instead of just having like a, a location and a path and a location and a path, you could say like, well, what are some secret paths that go off from these locations? What are other paths they could take? Are there alternate paths? What are the locations? When they get to a, play, a path, if they go further ahead, is there a way to see that there's actually another path that they might discover that could take them back where they came originally. Same sort of ideas. We're looking at it for dungeon design, but a lot of it works very well for overland travel as well. So the next time you are either looking at dungeon maps, thinking about your dungeon maps, thinking about your overland travel, keep in mind some of these jQuays style designs. And that includes, are there multiple entrances? Are there multiple paths they can take? Are there good, meaningful decisions about taking one path over the other? Does it have secret paths? Are there ways to crack the dungeon? Are there ways to sort of get past it and, and get a one-up on the people who actually operate this dungeon by taking these secret paths. Are there loopbacks? Once you get to a place, can you see that there's another passage and can you start to understand how the dungeon works by realizing, oh, that goes back to where we were before, that idea of loopbacks and shortcuts. And make sure that it's not too symmetrical. You don't want a dungeon design that's boring. You don't want one that's so simple that it's like one room and then a passage and another room and then a passage and another room and a passage. That's, that's too easy to crack. The, the, the design of the dungeon itself isn't particularly interesting. Maybe what's in the rooms are interesting. Maybe the rest of the story is interesting, but that design isn't interesting. Can you take that and can you kind of shake it up? Does it have elevation changes? Are there stairs that are going up and down? Are there sections of the floor that are dropped in? Thinking about, think about that Z axis. If you want to get really advanced, think about your Dark Souls style where you go through and climbing up and up and up and further and then you find an elevator that takes you all the way down back to where you started. So you have a loop back, but the loop back is vertical rather than horizontal. And what are some ways, if you are going to have multiple layers, what are some of the ways that you can have drop connections to this? I'm running the game Scarlet Citadel. There's an oubliette in one of the rooms. That oubliette goes four levels down. So not only are there stairways that take you from level one to level two, there's a whole other passageway that goes all the way down to level four in the first layer of the zone. So what are some of those multiple cross-level connections? Big cracks in the walls, rivers that are flowing, waterfalls that are falling down into lower levels. How do you connect these lower levels together? I hope you found this video useful. If you 
you did, consider subscribing to the Sly Flourish newsletter where you get weekly D&D related articles directly to your inbox plus an adventure generator PDF. You can join the Sly Flourish Patreon where you get access to all kinds of exclusive adventures, previews of new products, the City of Arches source books, all kinds of tools, a dedicated Discord channel, tons of stuff available for a very low price. And you can pick up my books, Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, the Lazy DMs Workbook, and the Lazy DMs Companion all in the Sly Flourish bookstore. Links for that are in the show notes below.